everyone will watch that one movie and probably everyone will have a different way of how it, what it meant to them. Oh, how rich is that? That's so beautiful. The best short films for lifelong learning recommended by teachers for teachers. This is Short Films Teachers Love with your host, Richard Lee. You know, I, I have difficulty calling myself a teacher. I'm happy to say that I'm sharing my, my knowledge, my experience, my information with, with anyone, anyone. Um, I, I was just going to say I teach. <laughs> I take people through mindfulness meditation at, the, um, at one particular oncology hospital. And so I can have between one, maybe one person or I can have several, and that can be the patient, the staff, the family and friends. And they are there for a short window, of maybe 35, maybe 40 minutes, it just depends. Um, uh, the patients will be having chemotherapy, the machines are going off, the nurses are coming in, um, turning switches on, just checking the patient. Um, giving them uh, a, a food or fluid or whatever they need. Uh, papers will be rustling and I am teaching them relaxation, mindfulness. There is a story usually attributed to the Native American tradition which illuminates different ways of paying attention. An elder talking to a child, says, I have two wolves fighting in my heart. One wolf is fearful, vengeful, envious, resentful, and deceitful. The other wolf is compassionate, loving, generous, truthful, and peaceful. And the grandson said, which wolf wins? And the grandfather said, the one that you feed. And for me, that was so perfect because it's true. We can call it mindfulness, meditation. I, uh, I say to the uh, people, you can call it anything you like. One lady said to me, uh, she, was, uh, she was quite a, uh, a religious person. And she said that she had difficulty with the word meditation because she associated it with, uh, I think, Buddhism. She didn't actually say that, but I, I, I'm assuming. And I said, well, it doesn't really matter what word you use, as long as it means something to you. And I said, you know, think of something that, uh, that you like, that makes you feel happy. And she said, well, I like strawberries. And I said, great. And she said, actually, I love strawberry jam. I said, call it strawberry jam. <laughs> <laughs> so mindfulness or meditation is about being present with what's happening now. So I let people know it's not about avoiding things. It's not about reaching a, a, a state of mind where there's nothing going on. The thoughts will always be there because it's the nature of the mind to think. I find that mindfulness and end of life are quite similar because we have these different thoughts. We have no idea of the thoughts that are going to come in. And the challenging thoughts, like the big monster in the boat, Zadik, to understand that, okay, it's there. 
It doesn't mean that I have to uh, approve or agree or go with it, but it's there. And then bit by bit, it will diminish in time with the help perhaps of some conscious breathing or some other skills that I can develop to deal with that. And then at end of life, I will be usually confronted with many different thoughts. We don't get a uh, an opportunity to practice dying. Uh, dress rehearsal. Yeah. We don't get a dress rehearsal. <laughs> so we need to be prepared that when I'm dying, my my body will change. The things that were important to me before, like fashion or, um, you know, the weather or what I'm going to do or what I'm going to read, all of that is of no significance because when I know, when the body knows that it's going to die and the mind accepts it or understands that it is going to die, different things become important. Family and friendship, connections, relationships, they're the important things. So, yeah, I think that mindfulness and dying do <laughs> complement one another. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and as you say, remind us of the important things, which I thought was a nice segue into the last one you recommended, which is the, uh, which is the, the lost thing. This all happened many summers ago, down at the beach. I was, as usual, working tirelessly on my bottle top collection. At least until I saw the thing. It sure wasn't doing much. It just sat there with a really weird look about it. You know, a sad, lost sort of look. Nobody else seemed to notice it was there. They were all too busy doing other stuff, I guess. Whether it's a thing, whether it's living or not living, you know, it, it's the important thing. So whatever the thing is for, for me, for you, you know, and it could be something that needs to be put right, something that needs to be, something that's, you know, outcast or homeless or lost or, you know, whatever it is in our particular worlds and the people we come across, that could be the lost thing. So it's such a powerful little, you know, short film for giving giving expression to that idea. I think that... Like it's sometimes we may see someone and just to be to show some human kindness to a stranger and that person responds in a really in a surprising way that you know that you have actually benefited that person. Or on the other hand, when someone is really nice to you out of nowhere and it just oh how nice. So that's a bit like that too. The, lost thing. I think we've all got a bit of the lost thing yeah. that always needs to be found. Yes, that's right. <laughs> but I, I, I guess I'm getting the sense too in terms of sort of bringing it back to short films and how they're used in, in teaching and learning and wherever we sit on that teaching learning spectrum. It sounds to me like what you do is very, the, the films give you both the opportunity to sort of sit and show someone but probably less that. They're actually giving you a tool for conceptualising your, for yourself to explain ideas to people that yes. are big. Is that a Reflection. fair way, yeah, re- way to reflect? Absolutely. So I suppose that's my lost thing, mm. my inner reflection. Mm. And that reflection, it's like uh, reading a book or listening to a, uh, something on the radio or some, just reading something and all of a sudden an, an idea will, will come into my mind and I'll use that and I'll follow that and it'll lead me to where that lost thing went, to a place of, what did your daughter say? Belonging. A belonging, yes, and I thought, yes, that's what I was after. From your point of view then, what, what, would, you, what would you say to other teachers? So I'm always trying to encourage teachers to use these little gems that are short films and, and you know, the language of film and, and, and video is so rich that we can do lots of things. And you've obviously found that rich in your work in, in helping people towards the death you know, stage of their lives. What would you say to other teachers that aren't in such a 
position but might have a class full of 30 rowdy kids or you know different what just teachers generally are there any other things that you would say short okay. films are great because it doesn't force us it helps us to listen to and also to recognize that we have a creative way everyone will watch that one movie and probably everyone will have a different way of how it what it meant to them how rich is that? That's so beautiful. And then for everyone to be able to share those ideas, I think that in itself is a really great learning tool for the children to go, oh, oh I looked at it like that, but oh, gosh, what they're saying is true. I can, I can see that. So I think that that's an opportunity. And uh, just understanding that uh, we're all a little bit different, but we're also very complementary. To listen to the full conversation, join us on SoundCloud, iTunes or Stitcher. For extra notes and community support, join our Facebook group today. This show is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. To learn more, visit edupodcastnetwork.com.